Section 6.3, the natural exponential function. So in the last section, we established the definition for the natural log function. Uh, we determined that it was increasing, and so monotone, and therefore has an inverse. So since ln of x is monotone, It's one to one. Hence, y equals ln of x, or let's say um, f of x equals ln of x, has an inverse. Let's call this inverse. exp of x, just for now. And we're asserting the existence of this inverse function simply because we know there is one. If the ln function is 1 to 1, there is some inverse function for it. Let's call that function exp of x, just to give it a name. Now, of course, what that means is the ln of exp of x must be x, and exp of ln of x must also be x, since these two are inverses. Again, we're saying that if f of x is the natural log function, the inverse function for that function is the thing we're calling exp of x. Note that since the domain of the natural log function is 0 to infinity, and the range of the natural log function is all real numbers, then we know the domain of exp of x has to be the same as the range of its inverse, which would be all real numbers. Similarly, we know the range of exp of x must be equal to the domain of the natural log function, which was 0 to infinity. So of course we're just again saying that these two have to match up and the domain of exp of x and range of ln of x have to match up. Now, for positive a and any rational number r, we now know that exp of ln of a to the r should be equal to a to the r. Okay, why? Because exp and ln are inverses, which means they undo one another. When the exp undoes the natural log function, you're going to be left with the argument of the log function, which is a to the r. That, of course, is well defined because we know that ln of a to the r has no problems when r is a rational number and a is a positive number. And since r is rational, we know that our power property says we can pull that r down in front of the log so that ln of a to the r would become r times ln of a. If we did that, what we'd get is a to the r equals exp of r times ln of a. Now, notice the key part here is we said the domain of this natural exponential function has to be all real numbers. Okay, that means on this line right here, that r value, which we said was a rational number, if we pretended for a minute that that r was any real number, not just rational numbers, but irrational numbers, this expression, 
exp of r times ln of a would be well defined. Meaning, if I pick any real number r, even an irrational one, and I multiply it times ln of a, since the domain of the exp function is all real numbers, I am going to get an answer when I evaluate this mystery exp function at r times ln of a. Okay, what that means is, if I know these two are equal for rational r, and I want to extend this to a definition that would let me calculate a to the r for any real number r, not just the rational ones, then this is the formula I would want to extend. And since the right side of this equation is defined for all r, all real r, not just rational, this is the formula I'm going to use to define what it means to raise a to the r power. So at this point, I'm going to make a definition. We'll say a to the r is going to be defined to be exp, where exp is this mystery inverse function of the natural log function, with an input of r times ln of a. And this would be true again for any positive base and any real number r. Okay, this would mean, for example, that if I wanted to calculate that enigmatic 2 to the square root of 3, my definition would be it's the exp function, whatever that is, with what input plugged into it? Well, r, which is square root of 3, times ln of a, which would be ln of 2. Now, we don't know yet exactly how to calculate this. We just know that there will be such a number. Since the exp is a well-defined function as the inverse of the natural log function, and its domain is all real numbers, there is some value that I can get when I evaluate this function at that number. And that's what I'm defining to be 2 to the square root of 3. It's a bit... Uh, indirect in the way that we're coming up with a definition for what a to the r is, but it's definitely consistent with everything we've built so far. So perhaps we could write it this way then now. We could say that a to the x is equal to exp of x ln a, and we've just changed the r to an x just to remind us that this is true for any real x. Uh, it's a good switch so that we're not uh, thinking that that r is only a rational number. Okay, so now we've got a working definition for what a to the x is. Uh, notice immediately from this definition, if I take the ln of both sides, Uh, what's going to happen? Well, the left side is just ln of a to the x. What's the right side? Well, again, this function and this function are inverses, so when I compose them this way, what I get is the argument of the exp function. In other words, those inverse functions cancel each other out, and what I'm left with is x ln of a. Okay, what do I have on that line? I've got the power rule. And actually what we've done on this line is just proven the power rule for any real x, not just rational x like we had established in the last section. All right, so this was the only loose end from the properties we had for the natural log from the previous section. Uh, we had established that ln of a to the r was equal to r times ln of a if r was rational. Now we've extended that to any exponent, even irrational ones. And this is where briefly we could think about what the graph of this exponential function should look like. 
um, if we're saying this exp of x ln a is equal to a to the x, um, notice that that means if I was trying to figure out what the graph of a to the x looks like, and I'm going to reach back to college algebra a little bit here, you should remember from college algebra that your exponential function comes in two flavors. There's exponential growth, which happens if a is bigger than 1. And there's exponential decay, which happens if a is between 0 and 1. Okay, notice that if a is bigger than 1, like I should have if it's exponential growth, we'd be talking about a to the x equals exp of x times ln of a. And what do I know about ln of a if a is bigger than 1? Well, if a is bigger than 1, we know that ln of a is bigger than 0, meaning this ln of a right here would be a positive number. Okay, on the other hand, if I think about this function on the right, the exponential decay function, if I had a to the x equals exp x times ln of a, and a was between 0 and 1, let's say less than 1, well, what do I know about the natural log function when that a is less than 1? I know that the ln of a is negative, which means in that case, this factor right here would be a negative number. Okay, now, if you think about this graph on the left, the exponential growth function, if what you're thinking ahead to, and of course you're right to do so, if you're thinking that exp is going to turn into e to the x, that is where we're going with this, and we'll be there in a minute, but notice if I had e to the x times a positive number, that would be like taking f of x equals e to the x, and evaluating that function at x times that positive number. Okay, what does that do when you evaluate a function at an argument that's a positive number multiplied by your x? You should recall that that's a horizontal stretch or shrink. What about over here on the right? Well, same story. If I said f of x was e to the x, if indeed e to the x is the same thing as the exp function, which it is, well, again, if I said f of x times a negative number, that would be e to the x times a negative number. All right, what happens when you take a function and you evaluate it at x times a negative constant? Well, you're still going to get that horizontal stretch or shrink, but when that number is negative, you also get a y-axis reflection. Okay, now, we still have to establish that the graph of the exponential growth function looks like this one, but what I've just shown you here is if I know the graph of the exponential growth function looks like this, I know that when I switch the base to a number between 0 and 1, the graph will be a reflection of the exponential growth function over the y-axis. Okay, so what this explains is why I have these two different shapes for the exponential function. It really has to do with this y-axis reflection you're getting when ln of a is either positive or negative. And what I've shown you here is that that depends on whether a is less than 1 or bigger than 1, which is the way you were taught this back in college algebra.
Okay, so since we've hinted at the idea that uh, we should be coming up to e to the x here pretty soon, let's get right to it. Since the range of ln of x is all real numbers, that certainly means that 1 is in the range of ln of x. Okay, and what does it mean for a number to be in the range of a function? It means that's one of the y values that your function can acquire. Well, to acquire that y value, there has to be some x from whence that y value came. In other words, if we're saying ln of x can acquire the value 1, there must be some x that does that. So what this says is ln of x must equal 1 for some x. Let's call this mystery x value E, and E stands for Euler, and this is called Euler's number. So again, just to make this clear, we're saying E is the number such that ln of E equals 1. And I simply know there is some number, so I'm just giving it this name. Of course, what's a number, another way to say that? Well, if I raise, or let's say I apply the exp function to both sides of that equation. Well, what happens on the left side there, of course, is again, I'm putting two inverses together. I'm putting exp and ln together, which means they should cancel each other out. And what I get is e is equal to exp of 1. OK, no big surprise there. Those two are dual statements. ln of e equals 1 is the same thing as saying e is equal to exp of 1. OK, now. Let's write a theorem which says exp, and remember exp is our mystery inverse function for the natural log function. My claim is that exp of x is simply e to the x. Proof. Well, again, using our little formula that we developed a little while ago, the one that says a to the x has to be equal to exp of x ln a. Using that formula, we may write e to the x equals, okay, so notice that my e is playing the role of the a, and of course the x is just x. So what do I get when I follow what the formula says? It should be equal to exp of x times ln of a. And of course, what is a in this case? It's e. But what is ln of e? It's 1. So that means e to the x is exp of x times 1, or exp of x. OK, so now I know the exponential function, the exp, which is the inverse of the natural log function, is simply e to the x where e is this number whose existence is assured. And again, it is the number such that when I take the ln of that number, 
I get 1. Now, this leads immediately to exponential properties. And of course, these are the twin properties of the log properties that we proved in the last section. And of course, there's nothing uh, earth shattering here. These are just properties of exponents that you already know very well, such as e to the a times e to the b equals e to the a plus b, or e to the a divided by e to the b equals e to the a minus b, or e to the a to the b equals e to the a b. Uh, quickly, let's look at the proof of part one. Okay, if I take the ln of e to the a, e to the b. Okay, since this is the log of a product, I know I can write that as the sum of the logs of the two factors. I could use the power rule on each of those terms to pull the power down in each case. And in each term, I have an ln of e, which is just 1, which means this first term should just be a, and the second term should be b. OK, what happens if I take ln of e to the a plus b? Well, in that case, I can cancel the ln and the e directly. It's a composition of inverses. And when I do that, what's left? Well, it should just be the argument of the inner function, which would be a plus b. OK, remember, the natural log function and the exponential function are both 1 to 1. And so what happens if the ln of e to the a, e to the b, and the ln of e to the a plus b are both equal to the same value? Well, if they're equal to the same value, the arguments inside that log function, which is 1 to 1, must also be equal. And what that tells me is e to the a, e to the b must be the same as e to the a plus b. OK, the proofs of the other two properties are very similar. And this sets us up for the important part, of course, which is uh, similar to what happened in the last section. Now that I've built this natural exponential function, the obvious questions are, how do you take derivatives? How do you integrate? Derivatives first. So derivatives of e to the x, which is the inverse function for the natural log function. Uh, notice that if y equals e to the x, that's the same thing as saying the ln of y equals x. That's just taking the ln of both sides. If I took the derivative of both sides of that equation, that looks a little bit like that logarithmic differentiation we were doing in the last section. The derivative of the left side of this equation would be y prime over y. And the derivative of the right side of the equation with respect to x would just be 1. Well, if I solve for y prime, that just means multiplying both sides by y, and I get a really strange result. It says the derivative of my function is the function. What that says is if y equals e to the x, y prime is also e to the x. Uh, what's the only function you've seen before like this, where the derivative of the function is itself? Well, the only other one you've seen like that before, if you think about it for a minute, is y equals 0. It's the only other one you've seen whose derivative is the function itself. Now, do you agree that if I had y equals c e to the x, where c was a constant, 
a constant multiplier in front of the function. Well, I know when I take derivatives, that constant multiplier is unaffected. And if we're saying the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x, well, that means y prime would be, again, c to the ex. It does turn out that the only function which is, let's say, its own derivative is c e to the x. Uh, you do notice that this example up here, this simple y equals 0, whose derivative is also 0, is just a special case of this function where c equals 0. So even this old, simple, trivial case is really just a special case of this c e to the x function. Okay, so what we've stumbled on here is possibly the simplest derivative formula in all of calculus, even simpler than the product rule. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Uh, what's the chain rule version of this? In other words, what would happen if I had e to the u, where u is a function of x? Well, you should be able to figure out that the derivative would be e to the u, times the derivative of u, which is u prime. And this is really the general chain rule formula that we want to keep in mind when we're doing derivatives of the exponential function. The derivative of e to the u is e to the u times u prime. So for example, you know, what's the derivative of e to the 3x? Well, it should simply be e to the 3x times the derivative of 3x. What's the derivative of e to the 5x squared plus cosine x? Well, it should be e to the 5x squared plus cosine x, that's just e to the u, times the derivative of that exponent which would be 10x minus sine x. All right, so again, even when that exponent is more complicated, uh, the derivative formula is still really simple. The derivative should basically be a factor, which is the original function itself, just recopied, times the derivative of the exponent that you started with. That's the basic formula. This is where I would ask you in class if we were looking at each other, does that make sense? And you would all be nodding really quickly. All right, so obviously you're going to drill on this a little bit in the homework, but I don't anticipate much trouble with this. This comes pretty quickly for just about everybody. Integration. Well, since the derivative is as simple as it is, the integral should be pretty simple too. And if the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, that should simply mean that the antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x. If e to the x is its own derivative, then it's also its own integral. More generally, of course, the chain rule would say that if I have e to the u du, I'm going to get e to the u. OK, as usual, what, where's the complication going to come? It's going to be looking for this pattern. The new pattern we're seeing here is e with some sort of exponent, and then whatever makes up the rest of the integrand, I'm hoping to make a du out of that remaining material. Okay, so you've seen these kind of problems before. The question is, is the material I have out here in that larger box too much or not enough to build that du? And of course, 
and the problems you're going to do in this section it's mostly going to be just right that is the material you're going to be given outside this e to the exponent part will make up the du you might have to insert a constant multiple uh, we'll get to other kinds of integrals in the next few sections especially in the next chapter a bit more where we might have to play some games and use some tricks to try and create something we can actually integrate in situations like this. But when you first learn this, they'll be pretty straightforward problems. For example, if I had something like e to the 3x plus 1, well, it's pretty obvious that that has to be my u. That exponent must be the u if I hope to integrate this as an e to the u du. So of course if u is 3x plus 1, that just means du is 3dx. So of course that means we're missing a 3. And that turns this into 1 third integral e to the u du. And that would be 1 third times the antiderivative of e to the u, which is e to the u. Don't forget to resubstitute the u, which was 3x plus 1. And there's my antiderivative. OK, what about something like e to the 3x over 1 minus 2e to the 3x squared dx. And again, this is where I would ask you if we were in person any ideas here. And now you sort of have to start uh, thinking through the toolkit you've got. You have the power rule, you have your six trig integration formulas, don't forget from the last section that you have 1 over u du. And now we also know how to integrate e to the u du. And I might be able to start combining some of these two or more at once in an integral. So when I look at this, I mean, we, we sort of follow the old rule of thumb when we first learned how to find antiderivatives, which was if I see a really big function somewhere in this integrand and I see that that big function is really a composition, there's an inside, which is that 1 minus 2e to the 3x, and then the outside is the square. So there are different things I could try. I could let u be that entire denominator. What make more sense would make more sense though if you think about it would be to let u equal 1 minus 2e to the 3x. Okay, why? Because I know that when I take du, I'm going to be taking the derivative of this guy, which contains an exponential function. What happens when I take the derivative of an exponential function? I get that same exponential function, possibly with a constant multiplier in front of it. So when I first saw this problem, the first thing I saw was the derivative of e to the 3x is 3e to the 3x. So the thing my eye fixes on when I first see this problem is these two are derivatives of each other. Well. If I let that u be that entire thing in the bottom inside that square, the du will be what then? Minus 2 times the derivative of e to the 3x, which is 3e to the 3x, which means du is negative 6e to the 3x dx. Okay, do I have enough material in the numerator of this integrand to make the du? Well, I do if I insert a minus 6. Now, that 
part is du. But of course, to compensate for that, I'd have to have a negative 1 6 outside. All right, what does that give you if you rewrite the entire integral? Well, it should be negative 1 6 integral du. What's the bottom? It's u squared. which means, of course, I'm going to end up with negative 1 6 times antiderivative of u to the negative 2, which is negative 1 over u plus c, which would be 1 over 6u, positive 1 over 6u plus c, or in other words, 1 over 6 times u, which was 1 minus 2e to the 3x, plus C. All right, so this example was to show you what you should be thinking about if you see an integrand that contains an exponential function in two different places. In this case, there was an exponential function in the numerator and also in the denominator. Well, in e to the ax, we know the derivative of that is just going to be a e to the ax. That means if I'm willing to insert the needed constant, I can always manufacture the derivative of e to the ax in the other part of the integrand if that e to the ax occurs twice. Okay, knowing that, the first thing that I thought of when I saw this was there's a big u squared sitting in the denominator, and I should be able to make a du in the top. That's, that's the kind of thinking, or let's say the pattern you should be looking for when you see two different exponentials together. Here's another one, oldie but goodie. Uh, again, this is one if we were in class together, I would make you uh, probably squirm a little while with this one. Um, I see 1 e to the x, I don't see 2, so there certainly isn't any material in the top. Someone might say, well, I could insert an e to the x in the top. Of course, if I did that, I'd have to insert an e to the x in the bottom. But is that really going to help me? I mean, I've definitely created an e to the x here, which is the derivative of this one, but it's definitely not the derivative of this one. When you take the derivative of e to the 2x, you're always going to get back some kind of e to the 2x. You're not going to get e to the x. The derivative of e to the 2x is 2e to the 2x. All right, so of course, the trick I was trying to use there is multiplying top and bottom by the same number. In other words, multiplying the integrand by 1. That doesn't work here, but it was a good idea. I was trying to introduce an e to the x in the top to try and get that du to match up with this e to the x. Okay, now, uh, that didn't work, but there is another trick you can think about. Multiplying by e to the x didn't work, and why didn't it work? Because when you multiplied these two, you created a different exponential function for which there wasn't any material to make a derivative anywhere. Could you try the same trick, but use some other exponential function instead of e to the x? What about e to the minus x? If you did that, the top would be e to the minus x. The bottom would be e to the minus x times 1 plus e to the x. Well, that's what? e to the minus x over e to the minus x plus e to the minus x times e to the x. That's when I multiply these two. 
Well, what's that? It's e to the 0, since you're going to add those exponents when you multiply those two exponentials of the same base. And that's 1. All right, now, this looks a little more promising because now I see matching exponential functions. And so, you know, there, there's no way to comprehensively show you the trick that handles every such problem with just one example like this. But showing you this one example does get you to thinking that there are things I can try like this. I can try e to the x, I can try e to the minus x, or e to the 2x, or e to the minus 2x. If I can end up with another fraction that contains the same exponential in the top and the bottom, well, again, I know the derivative of e to the negative x is just another e to the negative x, except with a negative 1 in front of it. So what substitution, if I was going to do a u substitution here, would I like to use? Well, again, I need my du to be in the top. So it would make sense that this guy needs to be what I make the du out of, which means I must be looking at this denominator to get my u. Well, this is an oldie, old principle you learned from Calc 1. Any chance I get to include a constant in my u, I always want to take that opportunity because when I take the derivative, that constant will disappear. In other words, I wouldn't want to let u just be the e to the minus x. I really want to let u equal that entire denominator so that when I take du, I get minus e to the minus x, the 1 disappears, and now I have this for a du. But of course, if I'm going to insert that negative, I'll have to insert a negative on the outside. OK, let's clean this up. What do I have? I have a negative integral du over u. Or in other words, negative integral 1 over u du. OK, now we're back to the log integration from the previous section. We recall that the antiderivative of 1 over u with respect to u is ln, and don't forget the absolute value, of u plus c, which in this case would be what? Negative ln of u, which is e to the negative x plus 1 plus c. If you were to look in the back of the book on a problem such as this, you might see the answer listed like this. And you notice the difference there is if they wrote the answer like this, they have changed the absolute value bars to just parentheses. Okay, why would they do that? Because e to the minus x plus 1 is never negative. Think about what e to the minus x is. We said that was the exponential decay function. It has a horizontal asymptote at 0. This is always greater than 0. So actually, this entire thing is always bigger than 1. It's definitely positive. So the custom sometimes in these books is when I get to an antiderivative answer that looks like ln of absolute value of u, you'll often see the absolute values dropped if we're sure that that u is really a positive number which in this case e to the minus x plus 1 would be. All right, so derivatives, very simple. Integration, not quite as simple, but won't be too hard once you dig in and start practicing. There, there's a limited, a fairly limited number of forms that you're going to work on in this section, and so once you 
sort of work through the homework, you'll get more and more used to those forms. And by the time you get to the end of the integration problems, it'll, it'll be pretty easy. Okay, one last thing in this section. Uh, let's put this under the heading of a very important limit. Okay, suppose f of x equals ln of x. Now, we do know what? That the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. So if I asked you what f prime of 1 is, well, it would be 1 over negative 1. So it would be negative 1. Okay, now, what do I know about the derivative of a function at a number? Well, I know that is limit as, let's say, h approaches 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a over h. That's our old difference quotient limit formula for the derivative. Which means in this case, what's f prime of 1? Well, it's the limit as h approaches 0 of the ln, because that's what f is, of 1 plus h minus f of 1, which would be ln of 1, over h. Okay, what's ln of 1? It's 0. So what this says is f prime of 1 is limit as h goes to 0 of ln 1 plus h over h. And notice that is limit as h goes to 0 of 1 over h times ln 1 plus h. That is definitely limit as h approaches 0 of ln of 1 plus h raised to the 1 over h. And of course, what I'm doing there is taking that 1 over h factor and moving it back as an exponent. I'm using that power property of the natural log in reverse. Now, What's that equal to? It's equal to f prime of 1. But what did we say f prime of 1 was equal to? We said it was equal to negative 1. Okay, and I just realized I'm uh, on goofballs or something here. I'm not quite sure where I came up with that negative 1. I took, oops, I took f prime of 1, which means I should have been plugging 1 in for x, not negative 1. So let's just get rid of that negative right there, and that should just be 1. So that should be positive 1. So this should be positive 1. I had to get to that line to uh, notice something was wrong. Okay, now, uh, what's so great about that? Why is this a special limit? Well, notice if I raise or take the exp function, which we know is just e to the x, uh, but I'm going to use the exp because it's easier to write exp of the right side than to write e raised to that entire right side. That's a little messy. So it's actually easier to write it this way. In fact, um, once we get past this section, we won't really use this exp anytime. But uh, for those of you that are going to end up doing some programming at some point, whether it's just a class or two, or you're going to do electrical engineering or computer engineering, 
you're going to see that EXP again. There's a lot of computer languages that use EXP uh, for the exponential function. It makes sense. They form a lot of those commands just, you know, out of words that we say for certain functions. So they just grabbed EXP from exponential. So it's a common usage is what I'm saying in things like MATLAB, Mathematica, Maple, and so on. Um, now, let's see. What do we have? EXP of 1 on the left side here. We know that's E. Okay, on the other side, what do we have? Well, okay. Let's remember something from Calc 1 here. We have EXP of a limit. So that EXP, of course, is a function, right? So the right side of this equation kind of looks like f of the limit as h goes to 0 of some stuff. Now, do you remember the theorem from Calc 1 that says if you take f of a limit and this function on the outside is continuous everywhere, Actually, what the theorem says is if f is continuous on the range of this function, but I'm just going to say if f is continuous everywhere, which in our case, f is e to the x, which is continuous everywhere, then the theorem said if you had f of the limit of another function, you could move the f inside the limit so that this becomes limit of f of g of x. So notice what I did there. I had f of the limit of g, and I'm saying that's the same as the limit of f of g if the f function is continuous at all the values produced or potentially produced by that limit. Well, this f function will be because we're talking about the exponential function which is continuous everywhere. So the upshot is what? If we erase all this, I have the EXP function. Oops. Still learning how to use my pen. I have the EXP function outside the limit. I should be able to walk that EXP function inside the limit. And when I do that, I'm going to get limit as h goes to 0 of exp of ln of 1 plus h to the 1 over h. Okay, what happens when I compose the exp and the ln now that they're together? I know that those two knock each other out. And so what I'm left with, when I clean everything up, is E is equal to the limit as H goes to 0 of 1 plus H to the 1 over H. And actually, you may have seen this before. If you had a teacher who took a few minutes to try and talk you through where the number E comes from, and there are different ways to derive the number E, uh, this is the formula they might have used in college algebra to show you where E comes from. Um, the other way, or the, well, there are several ways, but another formula they might have used is limit as H goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over H to the H. Notice that these two formulas, as H goes to 0, this h goes to 0, and this 1 over h goes to infinity. Down here, as h goes to infinity, this h goes to infinity, and this 1 over h goes to 0. So these two limits behave exactly the same way. They're both equal to e. Uh, you may recognize that one because it looks a little bit like your old... Oops, sorry. 
it might remind you of your old compound interest formula. And if you remember, you had another compound interest formula that looked like that, that contained Euler's number E. Well, we'll talk about this in section 6.5, but uh, this guy definitely comes from this formula. And I'll let you think about how, but we'll, we'll talk about it in another couple of lectures. All right, now, we have the quite convoluted way that we defined E, the way we build it up in this section. Uh, but now, if you want an actual formula from which you could compute or try to approximate E, I've got it. Notice that E is not really a number you can reach because this is a limit. And when I say it's equal to the limit as h approaches 0, it means I never make it to 0. Uh, this is really what I call a transcendental number. And of course, you're probably already thinking that this is similar to pi because pi is constructed with a formula similar to this too, with a limit. So, just uh, to kind of give us some numbers to look at, in the column on the left are some numbers that are getting closer and closer to zero. In fact, when you get down to this bottom one, it looks like I'm out to the 10 millionths place. One ten millionths is what I have in that seventh row down there. Okay, what have I computed in the column on the right? I've computed values of that 1 plus h raised to the 1 over h power. Okay, notice what happens. Uh, it looks like this is an increasing sequence of numbers in the column on the right. And it does turn out that that function is definitely a increasing function. Well, at least these functions or these values are increasing as h approaches 0. So actually it's a decreasing function. But notice the red numbers I have highlighted are the numbers that when I go to the next row stay the same. So notice when I go from row 2 to 3, the 7 stay the same. When I go from row 3 to 4, the 7 and the 1 stay the same. When I go from row 4 to row 5, the 7 and the 1 and the 8 stay the same. If I continue this process by evaluating this for smaller and smaller values of h closer and closer to 0, this list of numbers, this sequence of numbers you see in the column on the right, will get closer and closer to the number that we call e. So this is a, a transcendental number because it's defined via a limit, and there is no terminal answer for e. e is an irrational number, which means when I write out the decimal expansion for e, the decimal digits go on forever with no pattern. And so how many digits of e are known? I, I don't really know. It's billions at this point. Uh, but for our purposes, when you type in e on your calculator, there's an e key there, it's probably going to show 9 or 10 digits, which is more than sufficient for anything we'd ever need. Uh, but there's that old familiar 2.718 number, which is the number E. Uh, when we get to chapter 8, we'll come up with a really, really different way to compute E. Uh, but that's a good place to stop. And the main thing you'll be working on here in this homework will be derivatives and integrals. That will be the big thing to practice on. So. Good place to stop, and let me know if you have any questions.